So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the weekly Binala Talks. I am your moderator for today, Anna Pineda, and my co-moderator is Arturo Tablan, uh, also known as JJ. So for today, we have something that we uh, will be talking about. Uh, we have invited a, a, a longtime friend of ASP who is currently traveling right now, but it's a nice thing that uh, he actually agreed to give this talk. In fact, this uh, just to give this some ideas, I actually emailed him to clarify some information on papers and then he met, we got to chatting and he mentioned that uh, he has already finished his master's on uh, right now and that's why we started introduce uh, I, we were we got to ch chatting about his new research and we uh, that's why we started inviting we thought to invite him for this talk all right uh, and just a few, I think there's no announcements for today. Uh, so we'll get right into the talk. So uh, Francis Joseph Gasconia is an environmental planner and a member of the Philippine Institute of Environmental Planners. He specializes in spatial analysis and cartography for sustainable development planning, environmental conservation, and disaster risk reduction. He has a bachelor's degree in sociology from the University of Santo Tomas a diploma in urban and regional planning, and is currently finishing his master's in urban and regional planning under the environment and natural resource management planning track at the UP Diliman School of Urban and Regional Planning. He's also a certified rec diver, advanced open water diver, and a volunteer for reef check and GIRT during his three days. Uh, he's also joined a couple of the Katanawan, uh, Katanawan Archaeology and Heritage Project. So let's all welcome Francis or Kiko Gasdonia. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this panel. I'll talk about my research as part of my master's in urban regional planning called uh, Open Resilience. And thank you for the introduction. Again, my name is Francis Joseph Gasdonia. I'm an environmental planner and member of the Philippine Institute of Environmental Planners, GIA specialist and cartographer. We'll talk about a few things that will take about maybe 15 to 20 minutes. Discuss uh, why open resilience, a quick background of my study, and discuss about what do we mean by a free, as in free forever for phosphor G, how to conduct spatial analysis, how to automate, and why is it important to automate that type of spatial analysis, and where do we go from here? Why open resilience? In the Philippines, which is around number four now, I think, on the ranking for at most vulnerable for the impacts of climate change and other disasters. And that's why we have two laws, the Public Act 10121, or the NGM Act, National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Act, and the Public Act 929, Climate Change Act of 2009, which outlines specifically when looking at local government units on their responsibilities in, in order to mitigate and reduce risk for climate change and disaster. They are tasked in conducting disaster risk assessments and climate change action plans at their local areas. Recently as well, the HLURB or Housing and Land Use Regulatory Board in 2019 signed off on Memorandum Circular-19-01 series of 2019 that says that Municipalities, cities, local government units in particular that have their comprehensive land use plans passed earlier on must review them, especially if they are within or known hazards like hydrometeorological hazards or geo risks. So there are many types of uh, hazards, particularly that we could look into, but for this particular case, which is an urban area in Taguig City, we we're going to look into flooding and the risk of uh, earthquakes and the proximity to the fault lines, most likely in the within the 10 meter buffer zone for fault lines and easements along the waterways. I'm asking about how might the study determine a viable alternative to identify the exposure of critical infrastructure facilities, which is mandated in the laws earlier that I've cited by using free and open source software and open data. 
Because there is an existing uh, capability gap between how um, many comprehensive land use plans have been passed, as well as uh, the personnel that are capable of conducting these types of spatial analysis using software that they could use. One is there's also a lack of funding for many local government units, especially at the municipalities, you know, fourth class, fifth class, sixth class municipalities that don't have the finances to pay for proprietary softwares that could do these types of analysis that we're looking into, and as well as uh, the type of uh, trained personnel to, to use them. Now, to answer that particular research question, we look into these four objectives. First one is important is where to get the data, where to find the current data that we could use, the most useful current data we could use for our disaster risk assessments. And in our case, we're going to do a critical infrastructure facility exposure analysis for different hazards for flood, uh, the easements, uh, minimum easement boundaries of three meters that we're looking into, and uh, as well as the fault line on how many structures or if there are any structures within a 10 meter buffer zone for fault lines in the Geek City. After we look into the da different data portals that we can potentially tap into, we look into the a review of uh, spatial decision support systems for disaster risk assessments and their level of utilization and local government units. This will allow us to determine if uh, there will be existing spatial decision support systems and why they are not yet fully utilized or maximized by local government units in their assessments. And next is we also ask with our respondents, our target respondents, and all those working at the local planning offices and disaster risk management offices to identify necessary crucial factors in the development of a viable alternative framework for disaster risk assessment or LGUs. Now, based on that framework that we have gathered from the different parameters that uh, considered viable viability, we will apply that framework for our critical infrastructure facility analysis. So what do we mean by free? I see free forever. You don't have to pay for it. Now, Phosphor G means free and open source software for geospatial applications. It is part of this movement for open source and geo foundation. The, the difference between free and proprietary is that you have to pay for proprietary. It's a commercial license you have to pay for, and you don't have any, you know, movement in the progression of that software because free and open source software is it has transparent development because it's a code it's base code it's available for anyone to contribute to and inspect and there will be any tracking uh, code there that will look into your private data and uh, free software as well as accessible documentation and training available online so there's more of a community approach to the, the utilization of uh, free and open source software for geospatial applications compared to proprietary. Because most of the barriers to entry of doing spatial analysis is the software. If uh, most uh, local government units are only aware of a proprietary approach to conducting spatial analysis, it might hinder them in pursuing a more robust spatial analysis by using an alternative which is free and open source. Looking into the data portals, look at the 10. Why the, these the data portals uh, allow us to review if they will be able to use the data in, in that uh, data portal for our own analysis. We look at into three things their accessibility, their data format, and their license. Accessibility means it doesn't require you to have another registration, email registration, or another login to access that data. The data format is user, 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 usable, which means that it's in a format that can easily be used in a GIS application like QGIS. It's license, it's a, an open data license, and does not have any restrictions as part from attributing the data source. For access, all 10 that you can see here, OpenStreetMap, GeoFabric, Earthquake Catalog, Global Earthquake Model, OpenQuake, Humanitarian Data Exchange, United Nations Environmental Program, Open Topography, Pod Lighter for 
portal for archiving and distribution, Global Administrative, GADM, Namrus Geo Portal. They all pass access. It doesn't require you to have additional logons to, to get into that data. You can either view the data or download it quickly for your area of interest and use that into your preferred GIS application, which is in our part is QGIS. For data format, only one that does not have a data format that we could actually use for our own independent analysis, and that is the Dynamics Geo Portal. It's only a, an online portal that's a, kind of like a dashboard. You could just, uh, just view the availability of different uh, spatial data sets that are there. It is a rich geo portal. You can find a lot of information there for land use, land cover availability, for also for the current COVID. 19 data, you can view it as there as well, but you cannot download or use that type of data set for your own independent analysis. You can only view it. For licensing, most of them have open data license structures or only for attribution, or it's only for attribution for that type of uh, data set if you use it. But for the last week, you can see there, they're restricted to non-commercial uses and only for independent uh, researchers. The next thing we asked for our sample in our online uh, surveys, which we conducted as a snowball sample because of the limitations of uh, conducting these types of surveys, we opted for a snowball sample using Google Forms during the pandemic. So responses out of the 63 that we had were, they said that an application or a GIS application for a spatial decision support system that they would use, they're looking at the top 10 things that we have. One is it's supposed to be free, it's easy to use. You can use it on your desktop or laptop. It's open software, easy to learn. And they said that it has to have free plugins or extensions, has a graphical user face, it's online availability, transparent development, and a graphical model algorithm. In revealing the spatial decision support systems that are available for local governments or for anyone to actually use to look into, there's four that we checked that they said that they have used or they are aware of using them. And the four are Project NOAA, which was a DOST funded project before, but now it's part of UP Resilience Institute's uh, flagship program that will allow anyone to view their area of interest and identify if there are any specific hazards in that area. Same with GeoVis, but it's more focused on uh, geohazards. QGIS in a safe, on the other hand, is a hazard impact assessment tool. It's a plugin that you could use in QGIS allows you to determine the number of potential uh, vulnerable populations impacted by a specific or predefined hazard and the, the numbers of response that you will need to prepare for, like the number of rice, the number of food that you need to prepare, water, uh, things like that. Very useful for disaster management. For Redus, it's more for the rapid earthquake da damage assessment software developed by Philbox. And uh, they're also trying to expand more into hazard impact analysis. And lastly, what we develop here is our own exposure graphical model al algorithm for different multi hazards. Because when we look at the different preferences, most of them are ticked off that it is available. If it has an X here, you see that it's available in that particular spatial decision support system. On our end, the only thing it's not available for our algorithm, our graphical model algorithm. This is not like in an online platform. It has to be run within QGIS itself because it is an extension of QGIS as a graphical model algorithm. When doing our spatial analysis, we usually refer to it as cookie cutting because when you are trying to intersect two different uh, data sets and you have your boundaries where you want to intersect as particular information that you want to identify, it's kind of like you're using a cookie cutter. 
If you have a star shape or a circle shape cookie cutter in your dough, it, in this instance, your dough will be like your critical infrastructure facilities and your cookie cutter that is either shaped like a star, a square, a circle, a triangle. And when you cut it into that dough, to take the shape of that cookie cutter. And that will also allow us to have the attributes of that particular cookie cutter, whether if it has a type of risk attribute to it, if it's, for example, for flooding, is it uh, a low, medium, or high risk for that particular flooding? Or with, for boundaries, for buffer zones, for our waterways, it will also help us identify which particular critical infrastructure facility is within those boundaries. So you see here the written in text here the basic geoprocessing tools that we use. Most of the data we use are vector tabs. And we also use some raster data to mask them when we try to experiment the different uh, data sets for our analysis. So what we're going, going through is just like a tree step process. We have your input, we have the processing, and we have our outputs. On the input side, we have our hazard data. We have our flooding data from the pad. Uh, it's a LIDAR derived, which is an amazing data set that we could use to determine uh, our flood models for five years, 25 years, and 100 year return periods. And uh, looking to that data set, uh, we are categorized as well as between low, medium, and high. For easements, we use OpenStreetMap data for their waterway feature inputs, and then created a buffer, a three meter buffer, because according to our standards, there's a minimum three meter easement on the waterways that shouldn't be inhabited. For fault line data, we went into the global earthquake model catalog. This allowed us to use a vector line and create a 10 meter buffer because according to the minimum standards, that there shouldn't be anything built on top of that 10, uh, within that 10 meter buffer line. So there's just in case that there is a, there's a, a fault line movement and there's a fissure, the most we affected would be those 10 meters within that fault line. For critical infrastructure data, we also use open street map data for roads, buildings, points of interest. But looking at that data as well, it still needs a lot of improvement in providing more points of interest data and uh, coarser data sets for, for buildings and roads. So it's a lot of uh, improvement, but this is what we could get for administrative boundary data. We got that from the humanitarian data exchange, which was provided by NAMRIA, which we could use for our official administrative boundary data sets. For the processing, it's your basic overlay, you know, vector overlay intersect, spatial join types of processing, which I said earlier was just like a cookie cutting. Then for the output, provides us in developing our different types of maps for our hazard maps, critical infrastructure maps, administrative boundary maps, exposure maps. All in all, for this study, we developed about 75 maps in total. What is the importance of automation? What do I said automate to percolate because automation gives us time more to think about other things. I did in this study both the repetitive manual processing for each of the different questions that we needed to have answers for, like which particular buildings, what roads, network, bridges that are within the scope or boundaries are exposed by different hazards. So I did that for a few weeks, I'll manually doing it over and over again. But there is always another way, a better way to automate repetitive batch processing. And you could use that for what we call a graphical model algorithm, if you haven't used it before. It allows you to have a modular structure of improving your automated processes for that algorithm. It's, it's good for a lot of reasons, aside from the, the automation. It's a no-code approach to automating things. 
especially for a lot of local government units are not coders in planning analysis. It's also transferable. You can send a file as a model algorithm to a colleague, or if you have a group within a provincial uh, planning office, you can all contribute in improving on that code. This is an example of that graphical model algorithm where you provide your inputs, your processing, and the outputs expected, which you can link into another processing as an input, and then you have your final outputs in the end. You can see there in the far left, that will be your input, and the far right will be your output. And I've discussed earlier that our inputs for our critical infrastructure facilities include points of interest, road networks, railways, buildings, and also a population density data set that we could obtain to determine or estimate the number of people that might be within that exposed hazard, hazard location. And for our hazards, we have there our second column for active fault line. We were also provided that uh, function to create it its own buffer of 10 meters for the waterways, three meters. And uh, fortunately for us that the, the pod data set already provided a low, medium and high type of uh, information for, for the flood return periods for five years, 25 years and 100 years. You know, once that is automated process, it provides us all the different information that we need in creating the maps. Now we can use that maps to visually present to users this patient an analysis that uh, we have conducted and hopefully will result to a better outcome in repairing citizens and also uh, developing mitigation plans and response plans for them. So just quickly to show you uh, the example of some of the maps that have been made. So this is for the critical infrastructure facilities. These are for the the hazard data that we have. So let's look at the different flood return periods we have. It's sourced from, from the layer data from the pod. And these are the results of it. You know, once we have done that overlay, you know, that cookie cutting process, we can provide us with the buildings, roads, railways, and points of interest that might be within that flood return period. It can be classified as low, medium, high. Same with 25 years, 100 years, and same with exposure for the waterways and uh, the easements for, for the waterways and the 10 meter buffer for the fault lines. Now, where do we go from here? Now, this is a quick close on in this uh, talk is that looking back, the data portals are accessible, but some have limited or functional vulnerability, and we would wish that more of these data sets would be more publicly available, especially on data sets that will aid in, in a better analysis uh, down the line if we have access to these data sets you know, that, that should have been open data. And current available spatial decision support systems that we have reviewed and we have outlined earlier are not unfortunately not fully maximized by local governance either because it requires a lot of additional training or a specific person in, in, a, in a planning office to actually use that uh, type of application. And based on the, the surveys we had, there's a need for training in false G applications like Fugis as a viable alternative to be shown in this type of framework that uses open data, open processes, and an automated process that's more like a graphical model algorithm that could be easily shared among different planning colleagues and disaster management officers. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to learn something. And if you have uh, further questions, clarifications, you can have a Q&A &A later after this video, or you can send me directly an email and we can discuss things. And if you want to have uh, a draft of my manuscript for this thesis, I can also send you one. So there's a lot more information there uh, to present it in 15 or 20 minutes. So thank you for listening and I hope you have a good day. Thank you. Uh, six hours, six to eight hours para, go, para test para yung model. Kapag mo na siya,
mas tuloy-tuloy na siyang gagalaw. Pwede mo na siyang iwan. Pwede ka na magkaroon ng iba pang mga task. Pwede ka bang uh, pwede pag tumingin sa iba pang mga data o pwede mo pang ayusin yung analysis na uh, gusto mo gawin. And then, yung mga example sa binigay ko ay yung mga outputs na ilalabas niya kasama doon sa analysis. Para importante din kasi hindi na basta natatapos siya doon sa ating pag-aalam kung ano yung mga lugar na kung saan merong hazard impact mga potential critically exposed infrastructure kasi kailangan rin natin ipaalam sa ibang tao lalo na sa pagplano ng local government unit kung saan yung mga lugar nito para magpagandaan pa so yung ginawa natin analysis kasama na din sa flooding is yung minimum easement sa mga waterways na 3 meters pati na rin yung minimum 10 meters na no build zone sa fault line so mag- ang kinaganda ng paggawa ng model na ito, pwede siyang ipasa sa iba pang LG. Pwede nilang tagtagan, pwede pala nilang modify, o pwede nilang ilimit sa ano gusto nilang malaman para sa kanilang lugar. Pwede, for example, sa ibang lugar, kung wala naman silang fault, fault risk, fault line risk, sa lugar na yun, pwede nilang hindi ituloy yung analysis na yun at specific lang sa either sa flooding lang. So, depende siya. Then sa huli yung aking final recommendations and conclusions na kasi nga nung una yung premise natin mayroong pagkukulang sa mga local government units na kung paano nila isasagawa yung kanilang comprehensive disaster risk assessment and yung climate change impact assessment na ano yung gagamit nilang software na yung kailang kailagawin yung mga analysis dahil either kulang sa financing, kulang din sa manpower, ito yung magandang alternative na tinapakita natin dahil sa mga na gawa natin ng survey nakikita na ba sa yung isang slide na kung ilang percent gusto na naghahanap na, ito yung mga gusto namin makita. Kailangan siya libre kasi nga yun mahal ang licensing lalo na kung enterprise siya or pag sa proprietary license for local government units. And yung availability din ng ating mga ibang specialization support systems yung pinakita ko yung sa Redas, Safe, sa Georis Portals. Nandun siya, lalo na yung maganda rin yung sa Project NOAA, yung kanilang web-based in a safe na portal. Uh, limitado kasi yung mga ibang LGUs, hindi nila alam or hindi sila aware doon sa mga ganong klaseng pagkukuhanan ng informasyon at kung paano nila i-incorporate yun doon sa kanilang final uh, comprehensive or resilient land use plan. Kasi may specific outputs and requirements yung housing and land use with the board bago nila i-approve yung kanilang comprehensive land use plans. Then kung matatandaan natin, yung Memorandum Circular in 2019, which is yung pinakahuling labas ng HLURB, na kailangan na magkaroon ng review. Kahit na, kahit na approve o naipasa ng local government yun yung kanilang current land use plans, ibinabalik. Kailangan i-review ulit dahil sa pagkaimportante ng makita kung saan talaga yung ating mga high-risk areas. So, yun yung mga kailangan planuin. So, yun lang naman yung ating presentation kasi sa literature, minimal pa yung exposure ng paggamit ng free and open source software. Na kailangan talaga siyang ma-establish muna yung pinaka-basic na outputs para mas madaling sundan o madaling gamitin. So, pinitingan dito yung practical application for local governments. So, kailangan natin uh, mas simple yung paano paggawa ng spatial analysis na hindi siya komplikado, hindi kailangan ng talagang malakas na computer. Kailangan lang na yung current or up-to-date laptop or desktop na kaya magtakbo ng CGIS para may sagawa yung kanyang analysis. So, kung may katanungan naman, may lang naman yung ending ng ating presentation. Uh, pwede nyo may Q&A tayo, di ba? Ayala. So, kung may questions lang. Hindi ko lang makita yung chat. Oo. Eh. Uh, 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 ah, sige. Okay. Merong mga katanungan dito. Let me just stop the share ng yung, ano, presentation. Uh, Kiko, kung gusto mo i-turn on yung video mo para ma-spotlight ka namin. Kung okay lang sa'yo. Pero okay lang kung hindi. 
Ikaw okay, na dito. <laughs> oh, para na para maingit kaming lahat sa ginagawa mo. Okay. So, um, maraming salamat, Kiko, na ngayon ay nasa dagat. <laughs> okay. Magda-diving. Okay. Pero trabaho daw. Chok. Okay. <laughs> May mga katanungan din. Actually, may mga tanong din ako eh. So, ginawa mo ito sa, sa gig, right? Yes, yes. Uh, ang, ang isa kong tanong ay, so, ginawa mo itong urban itong spatial analysis na ito, pero to make uh, an urban plan, hindi ba dapat ito muna yung unang ginagawa ng mga local governments? So, yes, yes. Oo. Uh-uh. So ang yung data na kinu na ginawa mo ngayon it's just to update kumbaga not necessary pero may ginawa na sila dati. Yes, yes, pero uh, yung premise ng no, aking research kasi nag-hanap talaga ako na ito gig uh, back in 2013 after yung uh, flooding, major flooding uh, yung Habagat and then yung Ondoy. Metro Manila was inundated. So, uh, parang na-shock yung Metro Manila na bakit tayo binabahaan ng Delito. Back then, yung Australian Aid, AusAid, nag-launch nila ng program, yung tinatawag nilang Brace Program, to pilot it, kinililize Tagig City. Ang issue ng Brace Program is the uh, main argument then kung bakit support natin na magkaroon ng open resilience is your final output and your data of that risk analysis, that exposure analysis for flooding, hindi siya madaling hanapin or hindi siya publicly available yung data. So yung ating premise is any type of hazard information, risk information, or any critical info, exposure analysis dapat publicly available siya. And then yung data na yun, uh, wala siya sa a website or sa any available public data pati dun sa mga geoportals na binanggit natin wala tayong mahanap na result and then yung isang mga actually sa mga critical reviewer ng aking research is <laughs> party pala siya nung uh, consulting group was for, for the base program and they said that they were able to do that type of analysis pero yun nga yung aking argument na well wala siya sa pub- it's supposed to be public domain but uh, so then yung ginawa kong workflow, it all depended on open data. So in the beginning, yung ating open data is based on volunteer geographic information or from open state map. For all the building data sets, road networks, waterways, it all came from a community-led volunteer group of available online mappers who developed that data set. So yun yung, yun yung extract natin from OpenStreetMap. And then from that point, we also explored you know, those tools and data portals on where the hazard data set that we need. So fortunately, there's an available internet for flooding flood modeling. Uh, galing siya sa Lipad, which is now uh, is still retained, I think, under the OS here. So, uh, part of the... UP Resilience Institute, if I'm not mistaken, yung mga kanilang data sets. Nandun siya sa Project Nova website. So pwede siya i-extract, pwede mo siya i-overlay. So, Itawag na natin cookie-cutting uh, special analysis. So, wala ka na dito. Okay ba? Oo. Uh-uh. Actually, may mga follow-up questions ako. Uh, may, may tanong lang dito from... Our, from uh na directly message sa akin pero after that uh tatawagin namin si Luis Ferrer. Uh there's a question here. What can you say about the capability building ng mga sa mga LGUs? Ah, uh, yes, very important. There are I think two or three tracks for capability building and especially at the planning offices na naghahanda dapat ng climate and disaster risk assessments. One is under the HLUR system, the Housing Land Use Regulatory Board, they conduct uh, planning workshops. The problem with that uh, type of approach is it's, it's limited, fairly limited. So HLUR is limited manpower. And to conduct uh, workshops at the municipal uh, level, it's limited. Uh, ar- uh, around 60% palang yung uh, 
uh, merong updated comprehensive plan. So all the municipalities in the Philippines are around 1,600 plus. Around 60% have uh, updated. So yung remaining 40% yun yung pang kulang or lagging. And then yung sa existing na merong land use plan, pinapareview pa ulit. After yung 2019 na uh, memorandum circular, especially for areas with specific hazards, which is lahat din naman halos na sa Pilipinas kasi if you're not an inland municipality, most of the our settlements are coastal. Kailangan na rin mag-assess for sea level rise, for storm surge analysis, and other extreme weather events attributed for climate change and for disaster assessment. Our um, main issue is for flooding sa ating mga settlements along the waterways in different uh, settlements. Then, meron din mga offer na training programs yung NAMRIA. And it's also limited din yung scheduling na. It's either offered at the central office of NAMRIA or at the regional office to offer na GIS training. Then, others are offering by uh, private companies. They offer GIS training. And the thing is with some private companies, uh, they offer proprietary software like ArcGIS. That uh, in in UP, especially in UP Desbanos, there are some colleagues from from UP Desbanos that uh, uh, their own uh, uh, groups that offer free and open source training for QGIS uh, how to do these types of analysis. So in terms of capability building, it's uh, fairly limited, especially for municipalities, uh, fourth class, fifth class, sixth class municipalities, and other areas that have uh, limited finances and how to come uh, the capability of staff. Kasi hindi naman lahat ng cities and municipalities if they could afford consulting groups like SERP, <laughs> UP Planadet, hindi naman lahat kaya mag -offer. unless it's uh, provided by an external party like a uh, third party NGO na uh, magpaprovide ng grant. Lagi yung nabagay ko yung subrace program like Australia Aid. So other there are many international NGOs that are fund, like the World Bank or UN led type of uh, development program that are offering grants. But of very specific locations, lang. Uh, for example, if it's a critical watershed or if it's identified as uh, one of the highest risk municipality cities, do sila magkakandak ng mga capability building workshops. Eh, dapat nga connected to lahat, di ba? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Na iwan talaga na municipalities, uh, especially uh, in Mindanao, kasi nga nag-shift yung, yung storm tracks in the past na mostly, mostly nasa Luzon and uh, Central Visayas yung typhoon tracks. And then recently, pagdating ng November, December, bumababa siya. So yung mga areas na, na nakaranas na, na, na mga super typhoons, yun, na tinatamaan sila. So, so nagkakaroon ng frequency yung mga ganong class extreme weather event. Kaya kailangan nilang humabol dun sa pagkandak ng comprehensive disaster sa test. Okay, I think we have, uh, we're gonna call on Luis. Uh, uh, he has his hand up to ask a question. So, if we can... Uh, <coughs> Uh, salamat. Thank you. Uh, Francis, I, I understand that you're a Tumasian educated sociologist. And, uh, and so I would assume that you are sensitive to uh, sociological and uh, socioeconomic dimension of these uh, issues. Uh, my, my question is, um, would you recommend that uh, uh, software, these models include some socioeconomic uh, information so that at the end, it, when we look at the output, we don't limit our analysis uh, on the geographic and physical uh, output, but we can relate it would if we can have some socioeconomic dimension in the output, then we can easily relate the geographic physical uh, information with the socioeconomic. Uh, they mentioned, and therefore it would be easier for the LGUs to make uh, a more deeper substantial uh, analysis. After all, 
the 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 object really of this exercise is to make sure that we are address the concerns of people and uh, uh uh, would you recommend that? Or are there existing software that already includes this uh, information? Salam. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, in, in the in the model, you can include uh, population data. And the good thing about uh, uh, creating, a you know, putting in your analysis in a graphical model, you can, you can continue on improving it, you know, adding with specific types of data you want to include. For example, in the in the expanded model that I, that I developed, you can include uh, estimated locations of uh, population densities in, in that area. So you, once you do your spatial analysis, you will be able to also have an estimate on the number of at-risk populations, uh, the vulnerable population. And you can continue modifying it. You know. The the thing is with continuing to expand your model is finding the the right data. Well, that's quite of uh, one of the you know, the difficulties here in, in the Philippines is finding the right amount of data. And and uh, you can do that. For example, in, in the data portals that I reviewed, but the humanitarian data exchange portal, you know, it's as a comprehensive uh, data set for population economic uh, information data. But sometimes you need a more granularity on that data at, uh, at the barangay level. That's where it comes the comprehensive, the CBMS of the comprehensive barangay level data that LGUs is supposed to, to have. So it, it depends on that. At the, at the level of the municipality, with open data sets, there are some areas that you can still estimate, but to, to have a better analysis, you can need uh, more localized data from the municipalities, or you actually, you can do it as well with QGIS and other ex extensions to it for field-based mapping. That's also one of my recommendations as well for this study is to also expand on demonstrating how to utilize field-based mapping using open source as well. So you can uh, also validate the existing data, improve upon it, and also generate your own data on the field by including socioeconomic uh, profiles of uh, individuals. So existing data sets, uh, it's uh, sometimes limited, depends on, on the location for socioeconomic data. And also one of the special data support systems that I reviewed was uh, in a safe. Just in a safe and also part of Project NOAA, they also have the, the capability to provide that what we call a hazard impact estimate. That's an assessment uh, for this particular area and how many people that might be vulnerable to the specified hazard, as well as the amount of relief that we need to prepare for, like how many uh, food packs to be prepared. Uh, it's all people there. The thing is with, with in a safe. Uh, it, it requires further training. You know, it's a more intermediate level of analysis uh, for that. You know, to prepare the data set. Uh, it's one thing about these types of analysis na hindi natin napapansin is yung preparation of the right data. Because yun sa pinakita ko nga yung input, process, and output. Same with any type of uh, analysis, you no know, garbage in and garbage out. So you have to prepare your data set as well. I hope you're able to answer your question. Yeah, thank you for the response. Uh, yeah, uh, if Luis wants to add any more comments, so uh, please make sure to let us know if he answered your question. Uh, but for now, I think we'll call on uh, Sir Vic, on uh, Dr. Paz. So if he could. Uh, oh. Thank you. Thank you, Kiko, for sharing your research. Um, I just want to clarify, you know, the, what you're doing really is very specific to, um, in many ways, empowering the um, urban planning component of local government. Am I, am I right in understanding that? Yes. Uh, because the, as you shared, there, you shared about five existing platforms you know, from to one, uh, and, and um, it's not very clear to me what is the, uh, because they're all freeware, no? they're all free access and all that some are uh, 
uh, harder to manipulate perhaps than others. But what, what is the distinct advantage of your approach compared to the Yes, uh, yes. Well, with this simplified no graphical model, you can expand it. Uh, the other spatial decision support systems that I review, they're already development of additional capabilities and functionalities. You have to go through different types of organizational development. Uh, for example, for Project NOAA, to add another capability, you have to go through another step you know, to request that feature. It might take some time. The same with uh, Redas, if you want to request another additional feature, you might not have the, the resources and time to expand that capability. So, so are you are you saying there, um, you're, we're expecting, let's say, a fourth class municipality, first fourth class municipality, that you, you will provide this, this program and they will be able to use it directly. That's, that's, the, that's the idea. No? Yes, that's the idea. Yeah. You can, and, uh, it's so useful, friendly that it, it can be done. No? Yeah. And um, that's, that's, that's good if that, if that can be done. I, um, I only have one uh, worry, and maybe you should uh, put that. Um, and, and this is our experience with local government. You, know, you give it as freeware, but proprietorship kicks in. Huh? And then a lot of things that are free at the beginning uh, end up really not free. Uh, so they limit access and all that. Uh, so there, you, maybe you should think about a system that will prevent this tendency of local government to do that. Uh, I'll give you a, a classic example. Many fourth class, third class, or even second class municipalities were given LIDAR data way back 10 years ago. And, uh, and the idea there was to, to give that data to everyone, no? to give everyone access. But that was not the case. They limited the access to all this data. So they, it's, uh, they controlled no? the information, which defeats the purpose. I, and and, and I, I like the comment of Mr. Ferrer, and I think um, this is something you should also uh, really think about, uh, the, uh, the socioeconomic uh, uh, variables. But I'm thinking more com um, concretely, uh, I, and, and this is where your, your approach will really work, huh? because your approach is really at the level of, of the local government, uh, maybe the or, or municipality. And that is... Um, the uh, the pattern of behavior uh, when it comes to uh, let's say the last storm or the last three four storms so it's not just density of population so it, there's there's data there of how how fast the uh, how many uh, evacuated how many uh, where you know those those elements so that that will then inform the local government better how to um, how to respond maybe that's something that you can think about to add as part of that kind of socioeconomic uh, of uh, component in, in your in your model yes so so that's i think that's my what i really want to ask and comment on thank you thank you Kiva. thank you thank you thank you i i think can i also add one of the things that uh when it comes to proprietorship it's also the data so if they make the data, oh, it's it's different if you're if the local government is going to share it with the researcher, for example. But uh, what I also experience in some uh, working with the, some local government is that they do not have the capacity to share it with other local governments or other uh, so government to government. There's already that problem. So yeah. when it comes to the social, I remember when working with the with NPIP, uh, they there was a closed data uh, set, so they do not share their information with the uh, anti-poverty commission, with the DENR. So when they first, when they're yung nag-inuman yung mga tao na mga tao who were on the ground na magkakasama, na realize nila kaya nilang iput together yung mga maps na yan. Oh, and yes. then, biglang yung mga boss nila nagdagsaan na hindi hindi niya pwedeng i-share sa kabilang ano sa national government na, na, na nagulat sila at pati ako when they were talking to me about it na there it's already there should be a method na yung government to government should all have access to all this data 
according to their to their class siguro or access to data so, so parang maybe that's one of the things that can also be tackled and must be addressed then when i mean it i, I can understand the how how this data must be protected as well but at the same time at least have a capacity to share it with the rest of their co-workers yeah yeah i totally totally agree it's an observation so within the research you know I, I kept on arguing about the importance of the, the framework that i've developed now this type of setup this type of uh, automated workflow and this type of uh, graphical model algorithm will not work or any type of spatial analysis will not work without the ability to open up these data sets and you know one of the things that is also i think a bit ironic is that the philippines is one of the first signatories to the open data initiative for local for, for, for government it is also as a, we have an open data portal where you can request through the freedom of information act but the thing is it doesn't have to be that way especially for the doing comprehensive so disaster risk assessment uh, plan, especially now this time that not only are we seeing so the full effects of extreme weather events that are happening now storms are getting more powerful and they're shifting patterns we have to continue like, especially for planners and for other professionals in the urban planning profession so we keep uh, arguing that uh, that these types of events they do not respect boundaries you know, across different uh, different municipalities or cities and uh, provinces and that at the planning level planning scheme we also need to evolve out of limiting our own analysis precisely within just the boundaries or bounds of our local government units there's already part of uh, the an argument about sustainable integrated area development that you plan within watersheds you know, that's one of the things that are already pushing for that collaboratively collaboratively at municipalities within a spe predefined specified watershed should plan for that because you know flooding it does not stop you now within the boundaries of another one and what happens at the top of the one at the ridge you know, certainly affects what's happening down uh, the valley and essentially on, on, on our system uh, it's all interconnected and that's why i you know, totally agree and i kept on putting also that type of uh, argument within the research and also with existing literature that uh, this has to be there it has to be put forth and pushed with, with this type of uh, you know, openness to, to this type of data definitely Yes, thank you. thank you for that. Uh, I still have a lot of comments, but perhaps uh, JJ has a question. Yeah, I mentioned they had the question. I did have a question, but it was actually answered. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. Well, what uh, maybe this is something uh, because I don't know what the state is when it comes to the national disaster risk management of all uh, each province and each municipality should have an NDDRMC, uh, yes. right? Okay. Yes, the national, the NDRMO, then goes down to the provincial, and then down to the city municipal. Even at the barangay level, they should have their own. Uh, disaster risk reduction management office to coordinate everything from the different line agencies. But from what I understand, mostly the they're the ones who are uh, reacting if in case that well not reacting, but they're the ones who are mostly action based, not necessarily sit down on the desk to do all this analysis. Am I correct? Uh, ah. may, there's there's somebody who mentioned NDRMMC, ang mahilig bumili ng pickup truck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. distributed sa ibang provinces and municipalities na uh, part of the augmentation support for local government units. But yeah, at the national level, as a council itself, that's why there's an existing proposal to create a department of disaster resilience that would you know, handle disaster management and response coordinated by the central of government and then 
might be a duplication because under the existing law, the main responsibility for preparedness and response goes to local government. National government is meant to augment and assist if the scale of the impact of the disaster crosses boundaries of local government. There's also an existing amendment of the law. There's a memorandum circular, I think it's also uh, under review now on the declaration of state of calamity. So what are the qualifications of declaration of state plan that will streamline the response in terms of escalation. So before, if a specific, specified number of areas, like three to five barangays are impacted, then you within the local government unit, like a municipality, they will declare a state of calamity. And then if three or four municipalities are affected, and then at the provincial level, they will declare a state of calamity. Then if that's a, a wider provincial, wider regional scale, then it's the national government that will declare it. And then there's that uh, existing memo that actually we contested now a lot of international organizations, a lot of professionals are contested, questioning actually. It's a specified percentage of the affected population that would need help before you can de declare a state of calamity, which is, I think now they haven't uh, implemented it yet because it's confusing. Because based on that uh, memorandum, I actually forgot, I have to go back to, to my references, a uh, specified percentage of a scientific, it's actually said, I forgot the wording, but it said uh, through a scientific based analysis, if it's 25%, 35% of the population, the wording is not just affected, but actual needs help or assistance. So it's difficult for us, for example, in. in yeah, how is it measurable? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the this is tricky part. Everyone now is working into the, the latest buzzword in in humanitarian action and in development is anticipatory action. We will hear this buzzword from Africa to Asia. Every now is trying to generate you know, using artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms to anticipate the number of potentially impacted people based on those models might need assistance it's a tricky question because there are specific thresholds that you need to consider and again models are just models uh, they're, they're not like foolproof 100 percent that this is what will happen and for example right, right here right now uh the forecast for today was supposed to be raining 100 percent, but now it's been sunny all day so the science is is is, is there it's it's under development, but still cannot be relied upon. That's why uh, it's still tricky for for everyone to look into, so not entirely depend on artificial intelligence and machine learning. And, and fortunately, they're reviewing that type of uh, declaration of state of calamity. I think it's not yet operationalized, and that one has been existing for I think almost five years now that uh, specified percentages of, of uh, affected po population that needs assistance. It's difficult. And uh, maybe you can also, or uh, uh, that's also something that you're going to recommend, or of course, this is your research, this is your thesis, but what's the end? Are you going to give this to a particular local government as a report, or? Are you in chat? Are you talking with a local government official whose works you have also gotten? So for this, uh, I privately already shared this you know, within the Philippine Institute of Environmental Planners, which is primarily the professional practice for within city Sulitat provincial government on how to develop comprehensive land use plans. And as part of the, the planning for that is their climate and disaster risk assessment. Which is for, I presented this uh, last year to them, the initial breakdown of the, the research. Then uh, I will share them the, the manuscript and the workflow. And within the research itself, uh, we're doing the, the online surveys, a lot are actually you know, looking 
forward to learn about uh, using free and open source software to GIS because uh, the opportunity for training within the, the local government unit, yes, as, uh, I think we're quite familiar with the practice of that if one person leaves a particular department, if one else is trained on it, they won't be able to continue on the, the work of the, the previous person. So the thing with with, with this type of approach, you know, with the open development framework, is all of the materials, you know, the technology, the data, it's all there. It's open and available. Then there should be continuation of, of this practice. Just like the good thing about you know, the, the free and open source software approach is that it's been continuously development and there's a huge community support for people who are looking forward to, uh, to that type of uh, application. So hope, hopefully, uh, there'll be more users and faculty. And I think one of the main goals for this as well is like to develop capability programs with, within the, the professional organizations. But as well as with other institutions like acad academic institutions to go with this. Uh, well, based on, 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 on my experience, proprietary software is the primary type of software being taught in university. For example, uh, here uh, in, in UP, uh, at the, the engineering department, the spatial analysis is mostly concentrated on ArcGIS or ArcMap, that is uh, proprietary software. And also same with, with the School of Urban Engineering Planning. We, we were trained to use, to use that. But when you go out of university, most local government units, uh, they don't use that platform. They still have to be trained in other software. Like for DNR, they use Manifold and other software as well the, for or map info for other areas. And it just there's there's, there's no alignment because these are they're competing proprietary software from what you're taught from undergrad or graduate school with the actual usage uh, on the ground. Like I think uh, I think highly paid consulting groups uh, Hey, you can put this uh, that there's a monopoly on the usage of uh, of these types of proprietary software. So they train on it and they use it. It has also its pros as well. Yeah, you know, there's it's, there's uh, there are some processes that you can you can do in proprietary software, and there's a steep learning curve in, in doing the same thing with open software. But it is still possible. And the good thing about that. There's a lot of uh, people who are, who are giving so training documentation and Google and YouTube is your friend when you're trying to, to learn these uh, free and open source software. And there are no issues about piracy of software. So it was the uh, problem with the Python. Okay, and... Uh... I guess sort of as we sort of close things off as we don't we don't want to hold everyone too long for today i just i think i have like one final question and uh, you know sort of around uh, training again um i guess have you previously been able to train or you know guide local government units uh into properly implementing you know uh non propriety software like you know qgis or would you be willing you know to help in that process in the future yeah yeah uh I'm always uh, open to those types of opportunities, but I've only trained uh, some members of national and local governments you know, with, with QGIS and other open source approaches. But that is always a possibility. It's uh, the the thing is the I think <laughs> in my own knowledge I think there are only like no three or four groups or individuals and people who are offering uh, open source uh, training. Uh, for UP Spanish, there's GRIDS, which is also a good training group. Then there's like two or three other individuals who provide uh, training and open source software. It's not, it's not, it's not enough not to cover everyone. There's a lot of opportunity to provide that training and the certification. And uh, I provided training for planning and the, the RRM offices for 
uh, barm areas. Uh, for Bangsamoro areas, there they sent representatives uh, to be trained in, in open source software like TGIS, and as well as uh, another step up or contributing to advances in remote sensing, which is another area of uh, maximizing or utilizing satellite imagery to improve your Okay, thank you very much for that answer. It seems like a very uh, encouraging and um, you know very unique opportunity you know to 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 allow LGUs you know access and training for that. So hopefully you know we get more um, people familiar familiar with these uh, open source programs so that uh, you know we can start building off of that. Uh, you know, like you said, you know, with with the with the ability with the um, with the ease to access for, for, for these types of programs. So hopefully, you know, we can see that in the future. Yes. Uh, yeah, but for now, I think um, uh, people are still, you know, sort of thinking about things. Uh, I will we'll close things off for today. So again, thank you, Francis, for, for um, your presentation today. And thank you for your answers for the questions that we had today. Thank you, thank you. Uh, pleasure. Love it. All right. Uh, for ne next week, uh, in the same line of idea, so last week we had mapping and this time we also had mapping and disaster in uh, disaster risk disaster and risk management. Uh, but for next week, we'll also touch a bit on the sociological and anthropological uh, perspectives in the times of disaster. Uh, we have Meljo Meljo Loreto who will be giving a talk entitled "In Uncertainty We Pray." religiosity in times of crisis in the Philippines. But for now, uh, so we'll see you next week at 1 p.m. again online. But for now, uh, we would like to thank Kiko Gasgonia for giving the time to talk about his research. And maybe we can also uh, request him if the, uh, or if anyone knows, anyone whose uh, local government might be interested in the data, then maybe you can also uh, chat with uh, Kiko Gasgonia who's happy to, uh, as he mentioned, he, who's happy to, to give uh, trainings and also uh, ideas on his uh, framework. But for now, we will uh, end this talk. Uh, see you next week. And we apologize again for the technical difficulties. Uh, hopefully, uh, this we will, as usual, this is uh, technical difficulties is always the worry of, um, of our country. But so everyone, please stay safe and we will see you next week. Thank you again to Kiko Gasgonia. See you.